So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Do you hear me well? Yes. I can raise my voice uh, if needed. Uh, welcome uh, at the Austrian Institute for International Affairs. Uh, we used to say the leading institute for international affairs in Austria. We don't want to exaggerate and say in Europe, but I mean we are on the way uh, to become uh, one. Uh, welcome and thank you for your decision to join us uh, today uh, and not to go and spend some time with ice creams and, 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 the, sunshine. and the sunshine, but there is, there is no sunshine <laughs> anymore, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, welcome. Uh, the panel discussion is entitled Bosnian Studies, How to Understand Bosnia and Herzegovina Beyond Political Crisis. Uh, and I have a most wonderful panel panel uh, today. Uh, I'm first going to introduce the panel and then say one or two words about the book and about the context of the discussion. Uh, but before I do so, I also want to welcome uh, Wolfgang Petrich, president of our uh, uh, institute. I was not expecting you tonight, but I'm very happy that you that you joined. And Wolfgang, uh, just a kind of a, a, a advertisement for the for a new book that Wolfgang just published with Jakob Finzi and Christoph Seljo uh, in honor of Zdravko Grebo, uh, who was one of, of, of leading not only scholars but intellectuals of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the last three, four decades. Uh, but today we have a, a panel with three, uh, two contributors to a book uh, that I want to show. This is the book edited by Janeta Karabegovic and Arna Karamenic Otis, uh, called Bosnian Studies Perspe Perspectives from an Emerging Field. Janeta is one of the editors. Janeta teaches uh, at the University of Salzburg, and uh, she lives, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, but she lives in Salzburg. <laughs> <laughs> no, Salzburg is wonderful. Salzburg is Come wonderful. I, I, can, I, I mean, we all know. Um, like three days a month. So, <laughs> so next to Janeta, we have Misho Kapetanovic. Misho contributed to the volume with a very interesting chapter, uh, and he's going to say uh, a word uh, or two about uh, his approach to Bosnian studies. Uh, he is right now in Vienna at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, uh, at the Institute for Habsburg and Balkan Studies. Uh, I mean, the, the panel is not going to discuss the connection between Habsburg and, and, and Balkan studies, but it's an interesting approach. Welcome, uh, Misha. Uh, and uh, next to me is Larissa Lojic. Uh, Larissa is obviously not Denis Miskic, uh, who was announced. So Denis, unfortunately, uh, needed to travel urgently to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, but we found not a replacement, but I would say someone who is as brilliant as Denis is, a young uh, Bosnian, former Bosnian. Uh, you're not a Bosnian citizen anymore. You're an Austrian citizen. But uh, Larissa's uh, parents are from Bosnia. Uh, she belongs to the very active uh, Bosnian diaspora uh, in Austria. Uh, and later on, she will uh, int introduce the efforts and the struggles of the Bosnian diaspora in Vienna and Austria to contribute to a different understanding, a different picture of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in general. So, uh, and now one or two words on, uh, of, of introduction. Uh, Bosnian studies uh, moving beyond the political crisis, uh, why did we decide to choose this title? I mean, first of all, we want to uh, promote the book. It's a wonderful selection of, of essays, uh, of academic contributions to the newly established or emerging field of Bosnian studies. That's the first reason. But secondly, we simply wanted to move from this constant uh, reference to Bosnia as a land of crisis. I mean, whenever you open the newspapers and find an article on Bosnia, it's usually a political crisis. It's Dodik now today visiting, I think, Putin. Uh, it's the secession threats. It's emigration. It's political crisis. It's ethnopolitics. And it has been that way almost for two or three decades, basically, since the wars. The strong focus war was, a, first of all, war, obviously, genocide. Uh, but then, uh, usually on, on crisis uh, uh, in this small country in, in Southeastern Europe. Uh, and uh, we want and will try to go beyond this notion of crisis and to 
try to see and to, to look at Bosnia from different new angles. So that's one of the, of the tasks uh, uh, for tonight. Uh, and the second task uh, is basically once again to underline that there are Bosnians or people from Bosnia or with Bosnian origins contributing actively to the field of Bosnian studies. Uh, I think a lot has been written on Bosnia by Westerners, by researchers from European Union, from the States, and a lot of good contributions. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not any kind of a judgment about the quality of contributions. But I think there is a need to uh, simply to underline the fact that, first of all, there's a huge Bosnian diaspora. I mean, I think two million people uh, uh, of Bosnian origin live outside of Bosnia, which is, in comparison to the population, huge. Uh, and I think there is a new generation of scholars. There is a new generation of thinkers with Bosnian origin uh, uh, who are actively contributing to the new knowledge about Bastia. And I think uh, Janeta, Misha, and many other colleagues uh, uh, in this book uh, do represent this new generation of Bosnian scholars. So without further ado, I will uh, hand over to Janeta mm -hmm. to tell us uh, a bit about the book and uh, about the major arguments presented in the book. Uh, and there will be later on a possibility for questions uh, from your side. Just one last technical remark. Uh, my colleague Roman is recording uh, the <coughs> panel. You are not going to be recorded, uh, so it's just the panel. And if you uh, want to uh, tell your friends and colleagues working on Bosnia uh, who are not able to be here with us today uh, about the panel, uh, they, you can direct them to the YouTube channel of the Austrian Institute of International Affairs and the, the video uh, recordings will be uh, at latest tomorrow presented at the at the YouTube channel of OIP. So, so much from my side, Jonathan, the floor and the room and the institute are yours. Thank you, very, very generous. Uh, thank you all for being here today uh, in such large number and for the interest in the book um, and for the panelists and for Tibetan for organizing and the institute for hosting us. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the sort of background of the book, just to give you a little bit of an idea of how this came about, this what I call a sort of passion project between myself and Agna Karanehi Oates, and I'll do a little bit of a highlight of each of the chapters. I'll let Misha speak on his own chapter. I won't, I won't summarize your own chapter for you. Um, and then I'm very happy to open up the discussion after, after Larissa gave, gives um, a little bit of her comments. I think Bedan did an excellent introduction into some of the reasons why we sort of got together to put together this, this book. And it was started from um, basically a panel that was organized in 2020 during, remember when we were all online and organizing things online. And so at the time, Ben Moore from, uh, from Fon Bonn University, which is also where Adna Karamehich Oates is based, um, I say Adna Karamehich Oates because my sister's name is also Adna, so I have to differentiate the two Adnas in my life. Um, and uh, we had a panel with Ben Moore, they lead the, Adna is the, the, the director of the Fon Bonn um, Center for Bosnian Studies. Um, and they had organized the panel at the time to sort of speak about storytelling and Bosnian studies and the very large Bosnian diaspora population in St. Louis, um, which is the largest Bosnian diaspora population in the United States and actually outside of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Though I think Austria is coming close, and depending on how you count that 2.2 million, which generation falls into uh, the diaspora or doesn't, I think Austria would definitely be competing in that sense. But we basically put together the panel in 2020, along with Amila Buturovic, who's, who's a wonderful um, scholar of, of history and of Islamic studies, who focuses particularly also on Bosnia, uh, to sort of discuss what this field looks like and what is this field that is basically shaped in many ways by Bosnian-born scholars or second-generation Bosnian uh, uh, diaspora scholars who have been very much grappling with this idea of this country that you sort of belong to but don't really belong to and it's always there in your scholarship and it sort of occupies our mind. And in many ways, like Vedran mentioned over the last you know, 30 years now, it's been the focus of a variety of studies, very much focused on questions of conflict, of you know, state building, <laughs> of you know, usually topics that are not uh, you know, happy. 
um, war, right, and sort of this, this constant, you know, fatigue in terms of how do you create a state that is functioning, um, ethno-nationalism, politicians that are, you know, incentivized not to act um, for their citizens, but, you know, uh, in many ways against their interests. Um, and sort of in, in usually negative notes. And so what we reflected on in that panel is that there is this sort of new generation of, of, of scholars who are focused on Bosnian studies and questions of Bosnia and how to study Bosnia, how to do research on Bosnia, um, that go beyond these kind of what I would say slowly but surely are tired topics, right? Um, and so we very sort of spontaneously said to each other, let's put together a volume. Um, and then this book came along. Um, relatively quickly, because it, there was very much an interest and very much in conversation that was um, that was developing. And what we wanted to do is have this sort of um, interdisciplinary examination of what this field might look like. What does it look like today? Where might it be going in in the near future? Um, and it can, I think, be very much argued that as much as there are, you know, you could say three themes of sort of genocide, migration, intergenerational trauma that are very much interwoven through the interests of many of the scholars working who are, you know, like I said, predominantly diaspora-based scholars. Um, there's also sort of a tendency of, of hope, right, of what can there be, what could this field look like, and where could we go in terms of how to do research on this country beyond, like I said, the, the topics that have been focused on. So that's sort of the, 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 the idea, right, the, the basic idea. Um, and it was very much also driven in part by, by Adna and her work on uh, collecting oral histories in St. Louis and from this community in, in the United States. I um, mean, they have been doing this over the last, I think, 20, 30 years themselves and have very much a, 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 you know, a, a very large data collection um, in this regard. So that's the sort of broad idea. And I think what I'll do quickly is to go th maybe through some of the chapters or the majority of the chapters that, that um, we put together of essays. Um, there were 12 in total. The introduction um, was written by Adna uh, Karamehic Oates, and where she laid out very much this, I think in a perhaps more eloquent way than I just did um, in, in this introduction. Um, the second chapter was written by Hikmet Karcic and um, Richard Newell where they basically outline the study of the education um, of and the activism regarding the Bosnian genocide and sort of the aftermath of that over the last um, few decades. Um, and, how, and what they say, you know, basically is a cornerstone of Bosnian studies. Um, and they basically sort of discuss how this is a topic that's woven throughout the public discourse, um, that is woven throughout the region, but beyond and very much connect broader topics of genocide studies with this study of, of the Bosnian genocide um, itself. And amidst, obviously, the, the ongoing historical revisionism, genocide denial that we see um, both in Bosnia and Herzegovina as well as, as well as more broadly, I think that, that chapter very much speaks to, to ongoing topics, both in scholarship as well as in, in public discourse. Um, in chapter three that Misha wrote, he will speak about um, the ethics of, of doing research. So I won't go too too much into that. I'll save you. Um, I'll save that for Misha. Um, the following three chapters of, of the book are woven in together to discuss questions of identity um, in the book. Very much sort of this grappling of what does it mean to be Bosnian? Um, um, how is that practiced? How is that? Um, evoked, how is that maybe, um, how does that look like intergenerationally? So there's a chapter that focuses on parenting. Um, how do you parent in the second generation and the third generation? Light is lovely. Whoever turned it on, or is it not? You want to have more light? Um, yeah. yeah. To Bosnian studies, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, some Bosnian light. Some Bosnian light. Um, so questions, of questions of belonging, questions of home. Um, that, that very much sort of transition from one to the other. So I mentioned the, the chapter that's, that's focused on, um, on looking at sort of Bosnian American parenting practices. And when I say parenting practices, they did a quantitative <coughs> study of the Bosnian American community in St. Louis uh, through multiple interviews sort of focused on what are the challenges of parenting, how does this look like, um, how do you practice being Bosnian with your children, and how you do not practice, how do you, you know, questions of language transition, uh, transmission, um, et cetera. So very much sort of focused on, on from education studies coming from that perspective. Um, 
And I think it's particularly interesting for future studies, if we think of Bosnian studies as a field, to think about this also comparatively, right? How does this look like in the United States, which is so far away, versus in a place like Austria, right? How does look, you know, raising Bosnian uh, Dash children, Bosnian Austrian, Bosnian um, American, etc., children look like uh, uh, in a comparative setting. So I think that's sort of a, a question that I think will probably be in the room um, for Bosnian studies in, in the future. Asia Hekimoglu's chapter focuses on questions of very much local identities. So as we know, Bosnia is very translocal. It's very much your Sarajevan or your you know, from Mostar, or you have your own little, you know, little place from Gradishka, and you have your little bakery, and it's very much um, these, these very localized uh, stories and very localized ways of practicing identity. And what she does there is to trace sort of what do Sarajevans, um, how do they build community throughout, the, throughout um, North America, particularly looking at Canada and the United States. Um, in a chapter, the sort of third of these identity what is identity, what does identity building look like chapters, um, is a co-authored chapter by myself and Amra Mejic, and we're very much focused on this question of the Bosnian-Austrian community and what we call this new modern Bosnian diaspora. So those who came, who have been arriving and leaving the country, this emigration um, in the post-war period. Um, so migration that is not necessarily conflict generated, but you know, by choice, but is it really by choice? And um, that's, that's another question. In the chapter, we have a very explorative study that focuses on how do these individuals relate back to the country versus those that were conflict-generated. And we find that these, their practices are very different. They're very much, hello. Um, they're very much practices that are focused on, um, you know, how do you find transportation to go back to Bosnia? How do you sort of... Um, that builds community, or how do you not build that Bosnian community because maybe you have it back home and you live much more transnational life than, than um, those of the generation previously. So um, that's, that's sort of the, the, those three chapters. Um, the following two chapters, one by Haris Halilovic, who is uh, a, what, an anthropologist working in Australia, and the chapter thereafter by Mina Halonic, who's based in the United States, focus on what, what um, Paris calls Bosnian exile literature. So they examine sort of these literary uh, practices, how does Bosnian studies, how is Bosnian, Bosnia and Herzegovina written about in literature. Um, specifically, we know Sasha Hemel, and we know Jeva Karahasan, who died uh, last week, and we, um, Sasha um, Sanisic, um, <laughs> multiple, <laughs> he's my crutch <laughs> when I forget names. Um, and they basically examine through their two chapters very much interwoven how this looks like in Bosnian literature. So an academic perspective on, on, on the literature. And it's, they're both very beautiful chapters and I think um, that really sort of bring to the forefront what this literature evokes in terms of emotions for many of us reading it. And I think, you know, I don't need to say much more. I think most of you in the room have read most of this literature. Um, one of my uh, favorite chapters uh, in the book is the sort of penultimate chapter previous to my, the concluding chapter that I wrote to sort of put together what the, the future of Bosnian studies goes for. And I think it very much speaks to Misha's chapter, so it's a nice sort of semi-transition, um, is a chapter by, by Dino Kadic, who is um, a geographer. Um, he's working, he's finalizing his PhD at the University of Cambridge, and he sort of asks this question of, um, you know, who is Bosnian studies for? And he um, very much does this in terms of thinking about Bosnian studies being something that the diaspora studies, right? So he's uh, there focusing on four scholars who are this sort of new generation, up and coming, who are taking these narratives that have existed over the last um, three decades in terms of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and rather than focusing on the large questions and the problems, really thinking about everyday struggles of Bosnian citizens today. Um, how does this sort of translate back into broader, sort of the minor of, of Bosnian studies, anthropological studies, beekeeping practices in Bosnia? What can we learn, right? So really focusing on this question of hope and, <coughs> and thinking about um, what is there beyond, right, the, the, the sort of narratives that, that we have heard and that we continue to hear about the country. And I think he, his, his study is a focus on these four 
um, authors, mostly anthropologists, um, that are that are taking a, a different look at the country. Um, as I mentioned in the final chapter, I sort of set out these themes that I mentioned. I think about. Um, I ask sort of the fact, you know, we should be thinking about comparative perspectives, um, we should be thinking about temporal perspectives, so looking over time, looking over generations, thinking about these comparative um, views, and really thinking particularly, and I think Vedran mentioned it also in his um, in his introduction, this question of agency, right? This, this question of Bosnian diaspora scholars, Bosnian-born scholars, um, really thinking about, okay, how do we take the narratives that have ex existed, how do we maximize the research that has been done on the country and in the country, and how do we work together with scholars working in the country today and working beyond the country in terms of um, moving, moving it um, forward. Um, so we wanted to basically showcase this combination of, of scholars, of, of both established but many sort of younger and up-and-coming scholars, um, whose personal migration stories are very much interwoven with their scholarly perspectives. Um, and to bring it all into one conversation, which is why we sort of named the book as Perspectives from an Emerging Field. Um, and to collaborate closely with them and to start this conversation. And I really see this book as a conversation starter. This is not the end. This is really sort of the beginning and we're very happy to sort of continue these conversations and engage with young scholars. And I've been extremely impressed since, I mean, the book was only published early this year in January, um, how many individuals have sort of come forward, shared their PhDs, and how much this is really actually a broader field than I even anticipated it being. Um, so, so that is very exciting for me. You sort of see the fruits of your, your labor, and academia is not necessarily always something <laughs> where you see the fruits of your labor um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a positive way, let's put it that way. Um, I wanted to sort of quickly, before I stop talking, um, say something, uh, one last thing about the book, and that is that I genuinely do not like to judge books by its cover, except for this one. <laughs> the cover is absolutely beautiful. Um, the cover was done by um, Tarek Berbet, who is a Bosnian-Italian artist, um, and who was very generous in sort of thinking, or in conversations with me, thinking through what does Bosnian studies look like, and so he came up, he sort of had this drawing, and it was, it's a chichuk, it's a burdock, right? Um, of this sort of question of um, dispersal, of migration. We stick everywhere, we're kind of everywhere, um, and we keep growing. It's very much home in Bosnia, but you see burdock uh, popping up across multiple communities around the world. Um, it's very resistant, it's very resilient. Um, and so um, I just, that was kind of the last uh, comment that I wanted to make before I give the floor to Misha to sort of discuss a little bit about this chapter. Thank you so much, Jenta. Before, before I hand over to, to Misha, just uh, first of all, kind of uh, thank you for introducing the, the, the variety of chapters here in such an such a excellent manner. Uh, if you ever thought that you will be just coming to listen to the discussion and not uh, going immediately to an independent bookseller to order the book, uh, you you basically uh, misunderstood the whole exercise. <laughs> no, you have to buy the book. No, but, uh, no. Yeah. no, you don't have to. But I think now after after you just listen to, to Janetta, I, I think to, there are numerous reasons to buy this book. Uh, and by the way, not to forget Wolfgang Petri's book. Wolfgang, book just to be buy all the books. Just to be on the safe side. You never know. I mean, <laughs> no, it's also, it's 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 a wonderful second book that you need to buy. Uh, but I uh, also wanted to say that tonight's discussion, panel discussion, is very special because it uh, is not happening uh, every day that we have visitors from South Korea uh, traveling from South Korea to join us for, for, for a book presentation discussion. Janet's sisters took the whole way from South Korea to join us uh, tonight, so I think uh, that's also uh, quite special. But now to, uh, to Misha, Misha Kapitani's contribution uh, entitled Fieldwork in No Man's Land. Uh, and just one sentence from, from the first page that I want to read and quote, and then I hand over to you, supporting Misha. The current knowledge production relationship is asymmetrical. Uh, with international researchers researching and setting the narrative about society by locals serve as the object of study, fighting for or rejecting foreigners' interests. Uh, and, and when I read your, your chapter, I totally understood basically the, the whole point, but I mean, you're going to just explain it much better than I can. 
Uh, so, Misha, the, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Vedan. That's very kind. Uh, I only heard commas that were excessive there. <laughs> it always happened like that. First of all, uh, hi everyone. Nice to see you t tonight. I, I. So when Janet was saying that she's from Salzburg, I probably represent Brigitte now. Uh, <laughs> and I work here at the Institute for Housework and Balkan Studies, but currently I'm sort of a guest teacher at the University of Mainz, and I just arrived uh, from Mainz this morning by. Uh, with night train, I did not really sleep. So if I don't sound pretty lucid, don't you know, don't take it against me, please. Blame okay, the, blame the, the radio. We, we are going to blame Deutsche Bahn because Deutsche Bahn. Really <laughs> started to blame. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. yes. Anyway, so uh, this <laughs> book, sort of, I was really happy to join it, and it actually came because Janet and I met on another book pro project, which sort of goes on and it has its own life, which we'll see how it will. Developed and over there, I think like it was just like first thing that we saw each other, and I was immediately running to my presentation. And my, my work there is about good life in Bosnia, and why I'm unable to read about good life in Bosnia. It's like long term frustration of mine, where you know like like usual topics are the topics that are also sort of uh, that we write about in this volume, which is genocide studies, migration, and then identity politics and then overall ethnopolitics. Uh, politi uh, but if we want to learn something about you know, how Bosnians put meaning in well-being or hope or just what, or love or whatever life makes worth living, it's really hard to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and I was just presenting it and actually I was sort of like going around with my, my arguments because also like I, I don't want to sound apolitical and because I, I also come from Republika Srpska and it also brings gravity, right? When you, when you like, so don't want to speak about politics or genocide, but you want to speak about good life, right? But the reason where I was coming from was that actually a month before that we were in Banja Luka and we were discussing people that were uh, prosec uh, sorry, like kicked out from, from the city in 1991-1992, which is 80,000 people and 400 killed people, and which are all well-documented people. And we were still meeting surprise of our colleagues. And then I was like getting, starting to wonder, why do we even do that? <coughs> So on one side, I, cannot, I was not able to read about good life, but on the other side also, if I'm reading about genocide, there is saturation of this, and people, even though there is so much of research, it doesn't get trickled down. And these were the two frustrations that were, I was speaking about, and then Janet approached me, and then she was also like, hey, there's this another book project, would you like to join? And I was like, extra work, nice, let's do that. Okay, so this is how I started. Uh, the, to uh, how I got into the project. And then I also decided to speak about something superbly boring, which is research ethics. Because, you know, everybody wants to speak about Dodik, and everybody wants to speak about, like, what's Dodik obstructing this week, but nobody really wants to speak about how we are going to build research infrastructure that does not exist there at the moment. And this is a much tougher question, and I sort of felt needed that somebody should start this conversation, and sh we should maybe start rolling it uh, so what was interesting for me, for example, when I started reading and uh, trying to figure out what, what the state of the art in the field is, there were two processes that were going on. One process that's really, that's really important is internalization, inter sorry, interna internationalization, thank you so much. Uh, I'm his crush sometimes. Yeah, uh, of, of research where, yeah, if you want to read about Bosnia, you don't go to Bosnia. You go to the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, maybe Europe. Sometimes Eastern Europe, but that's it, right? Uh, and then also other problem that I saw or, or opportunity was the interdisciplinarity. That of course, like everywhere else from 1990s, we sort of embraced it as a concept, and we are sort of trying to break boundaries of our disciplines. But what also that brings us is that everybody can do everything. And while it works for us as scholars that are already speaking from specific disciplines, it has different effects on, on actually the field of study on Bosnia. So what happened is that I was just, you know, being me doing my, my research project, I was, uh, I was uh, in 2000 and I think 17, I was sitting down in, in a, on a mountain, uh, Grmec, in a village called Bursci Palanka, and I was doing interviews with people as part of anthropological field work, which is what I do. And of course, I was coming there with my illusions that nobody there was before me because I couldn't really Google the, the, the field of study. And then I asked the people that I was speaking with, like, did anybody really come before me? And they were like, oh, yeah, sure. And then they named 10 different <laughs> names. And this was like kind of a surprise. Uh, but the other surprise was that actually when I checked those people, I found three 
boys, I would say, who were making videos and who made a whole movie about this this village and the monument next to it and socialist modernist monuments, where which became rather popular and they were completely misrepresenting everything that was that was done there. So they were they were sort of mixing fiction with, with reality. They were not really uh, uh, crediting authors. They even included persons that had severe mental health issues and and the person thought things that they are speaking with aliens and uses these monuments as communication channels, and they just presented them as random Balkanese person doing the normal stuff, right? So of course I had problems with that, and it's, you know, it triggered me, it's also like, it's, it's, it's something very serious to work with. And then I was thinking like, yeah, there is this uh, uh, sort of uh, imbalance that's going on that students from Britain or from the US or from Germany can hop on Ryanair, take cameras, take, take microphones, go to a village, and they're just gonna go and uh, chase people around and interview them, while Bosnian, not even scholars are able to do that in, in the other way around. So this is where, where I was coming from. And then to answer this question, then I started to speak, okay, what is the infrastructure and what do we have, uh, what do we have here? I'm getting like too many stories, but sorry, <laughs> forgive me for that, but like there's another story coming, coming here. So uh, what was really important for me to, to uh, and what I, what I saw is that we, in Bosnia, the, there was a specific situation where Bosnia, after independence, also went through severe international intervention. And we, the people that were building and uh, <coughs> reconstructing the country, which that did fair work, also came researchers who were cooperating with them or doing working on their own, who were also part of, of this project. And while that trickled down, now, nowadays kids who are coming can al always be recognized as part of this big group of big sort of cloud of people that came in the last 20, 25 years. And this is what I was trying to sort of, uh, to, to, to see how it actually trickle, trickles down to research. Maybe to sort of wrap it up here, like what was very useful for me was actually a joke that was uh, 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 that told, told uh, to me by my colleague Lisa Helms, who is also sitting here, hi Lisa, uh, which is that this presence of international intervention also created the idea of stranac or a foreigner or alien or this person that comes to Bosnia and has any rights to do what, what they would like to do. And the joke that Elisa told me was that about this typical Bosnian guy, Mujo, uh, uh, <laughs> being in Sarajevo and uh, coming to Kafana and uh, for, for coffee and meeting, meeting stranac or foreigner there. And Mujo asked him, oh, hey, how are you? What are you doing here? And uh, sorry, he asked me, oh, uh, so when did you arrive? He's like, yesterday. And when are you leaving? Tomorrow. Oh, what are you doing here? Well, I'm writing a book. Oh, what's the book title? Bosnia, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and this is sort of caricature of what we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. So to, to sort of sum, sum, sum it up, what I did is that I sit down and I went through all possible ways of how ethics is sort of uh, conceptualized and frameworked in Bosnia. I also tried to see what European frameworks are there. And I went through my, also my personal journey through learning about ethics. And I tried to sort of write about how we can navigate this to, uh, to, to build better infrastructure, to make more sustainable field work also if we want to go back to Bosnia and do more research there. I'm going to stop there and let you to read something in the chapter. So, <laughs> Misha, thank you so much. I mean, uh, first of all, for the stories and uh, <laughs> for the joke. And uh, I think we can promise that Misha is not going to write a book anytime soon entitled Bosnia and Herzegovina yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So that's not, not, not going to happen. Uh, I mean, if there is one chapter that I missed in the book, is basically the Boston hyper production of jokes and, 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 and this kind of approach to, which is. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to cope with reality uh, and, and, and with realities, if you, if you wish so to put it in, in, in plural. Uh, but that's going to be in the next book. Now, uh, over to uh, Larissa Lovic. Uh, she hasn't published a book yet, yes. but I'm <laughs> quite confident she is going to, to publish a lot of books because she's a dedicated uh, student of political sciences. Uh, uh, but uh, Larissa, uh, Larissa, uh, there is a group of young people of, from Bosnia diaspora, uh, just to tell a quick story, uh, who organized, uh, starting organizing themselves in, in 2021, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at the peak of this kind of political crisis. You know, remember uh, INSCO issued the, the, uh, the law and then Dodik uh, was going mad uh, once again uh, for 1700 
25th time. Uh, and then young people, I mean, Bosnia and Austrians, probably have to say, uh, stood up and said, uh, okay, let's, let's do something. Let's mobilize the community. Let's inform the public. Let's mobilize the community. Uh, and they managed basically to uh, put the biggest uh, protest or rally uh, pro Bosnian Larry on the streets uh, of the city of Vienna uh, after all these kind of uh, Corona uh, demonstrations. So that the first positive big uh, demonstration rally uh, on the streets of Vienna was the one organized by young. Uh, uh, young Austria Bosnian uh, members of diaspora. Uh, so, Arisa, uh, first of all, I would, I mean, my, my first question would be basically, uh, uh, and it's partly tackled in the book, uh, how do you see and perceive Bosnia? What does Bosnia mean for you as a, as a young Bosnian Austrian? But then, secondly, I would also ask you to, to see few words and sentences about your struggles from the Bosnian diaspora. How did you decide to start fighting for this kind of pro-Bosnian cause? And how does it fit into this kind of uh, larger uh, issue of mobilization of Bosnian diaspora uh, for mm -hmm. something positive and, let's say, for hope uh, when it comes to, to this country? Uh, first of all, it's an honor to sit here with you, I have to say. Um, and I mean the question of Bosnia is in the end the question that comes to my constant identity crisis and that I think this is something that unites people from any diaspora. It's this, you're not completely, I mean some of you will know that the Austrian society is not the most open society always. So they do give you the feeling that you don't belong there 100%. But also in the end, I mean, I'm born and raised in Vienna. I was born with an Austrian citizenship. If somebody asked me what is my home, I would most probably say Vienna. I never lived anywhere else. But then, because of the proximity you have with Bosnia and Austria, every weekend we would drive there and spend the week with my grandmother or be there during the summers. And it was the second home you had. And I think when you grow up as a child, you don't even understand this weird, like it's, you just go to Bosnia, you don't even question it. And then the older you get, you understand, okay, you're not completely part of this reality, and you're also not comp completely part of the other reality. And then you somehow have to understand even the question when you had the struggle with how you introduce me, what mm -hmm. am I, am I Austrian, am I Bosnian? And I think what the diaspora does is we have kind of, we bring a new identity in. And mm -hmm. neither, I am fully Austrian, but I'm also Bosnian, but also in the back of my mind, that is what was quite, um, I think, important about the activism we had, was that we never lived in Bosnia, none of us. It was Dennis who should sit here and said he cannot, my sister and me, and then with the organization, uh, it's a youth organization, it's called Bosnia and Herzegovina and Austrian um, um, Youth, and we organized this rally, we organized the movie screening, we organized panel discussions, and what we always had in the back of our mind is something which you also mentioned, this ethical background of, so we don't want to be the ones talking for the people living in Bosnia, we cannot. We can speak for the diaspora and we can be a catalyzer in the way of, um, we started this whole activism with, I can then date from, I will come to the answer of what is Bosnia for me. And um, we started this whole activism um, in November 2021, when there was this huge, Crisis with Bodic, as you mentioned, that the whole idea behind it was this thing is happening in a country that had war only 30 years ago and nobody's talking about it. I think there was maybe one article from Adhard Werfel, I guess he said something about it, but we just wanted the Austrian, um, the Austrian, I don't know, society to start recognizing, hey, there's something happening just six hours away from here, six or five, six hours of the car, depends on how fast we drive. Um, and where you live. Very true. Very yeah, I know, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, and our goal was to just get people talking about it and not have us talking about it. And this was also something we discussed. We asked, why do we have to do it again? Why do the Miskic and Lojic have to be the ones standing up for a boss in Herzegovina? Why is nobody else interested in it? Um, and then we realized you can sit down, I don't want to sit down. Yeah. <laughs> and then we realize we should not fight this 
Because I think this is what Brian mentioned, Austrian society is not only very open. You grow up with this kind of shame as well, that you don't belong to one completely. And I think this is where this whole identity crisis thing then comes in, and the question of always being asked, are you more Austrian, are you more Bosnian, and both. For me right now, I mean, I'm very glad that I have the confidence now to say when I say home, it is Bosnia or, or Vienna, what I feel that for now. And my sister will always understand what I'm talking about when I say home. So I think it is all these factors that come together and where we realize at the diaspora we have the opportunity and I feel like we have the duty a bit as well because we have these privileges that we grow up here and we cannot change Bosnian society and this is not what we should do. We should not implement our way of thinking on them. But what we can do is help maybe scholars, maybe scholars here and maybe also get people talking and thinking about Bosnia in, in a different way. As you said, it's not always crisis. I mean, that's the way we started. We started because there was a crisis, but then we even saw when we did this movie screening, this demonstration, and people are interested in it beyond the diaspora, beyond they each are interested in it. And then we even made a, um, a study trip to Bosnia where we had 15 people. Half of them had a diaspora background, and the second half of them were fully Austrian, as you could say. Um, and we went to Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia and Serbia, and, we sh and it was such a success because you could see this mixing of Austrian and Bosnian culture. I mean, we would sit in this bus and listen to Bosnian music, as we all used to, but also listen to, I don't know, Pipo, and everybody knew all the songs. So you could see this mixing of identities. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that explains to me also what is Bosnia. Bosnia is a kind of home, but as well as Austria is a kind of home. So. Mm -hmm. I think, um, to conclude a bit, um, I think we just have to start thinking differently the way we approach identities, the way we in the diaspora also work together with the people living in our parents' home and maybe our future home. Is there an question? Thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Larissa. I think there will be probably questions and you, you can... Uh, to uh, oh, and just one thing that I want to mention, yes. mm -hmm. what I think is very important, a lot of us, which I think is not an accident, are the ones studying political science, like me, my sister studied it, Dennis is studying it as well, because we've been seeing inequalities from the day we were born. We could see the way maybe our parents were treated because they had a bit of an accent in the German, or the way we are treated. And I think this drove us all that we want to find out more about it. This, this is why a lot of us are being are trying to be researchers or are studying to be scholars. But I think what is very important is that we shouldn't just see us as scholars, but also as activists, because I think this is a more positive approach to it. So we should, of course, we should produce knowledge, but also use this knowledge in a good way and change this narrative that you mentioned also before. Thanks a lot. Uh, in the description of the of the today's discussion, there is one sentence, and I'm just going to read it. How does Bosnia studies help us to situate understanding of the social political reality of Bosnia and Herzegovina today? Uh, Janet, I think you mentioned the tendency of hope, uh, uh, and there's this wonderful book uh, by uh, by uh, I think uh, a U.S. American philosopher Martin Nussbaum, if I'm not mistaken, Monarchy of Fear where she uh, engages with the principle of hope. And she says, I mean, hope as a, as, a, as a mere principle is, I mean, just forget it, but what we need, we need practices of hope. Uh, and now a quick question before we turn to you and, and to Q&A uh, will be the following one. Uh, after all the work that you've done, uh, your research uh, presented in the book, uh, speaking about the hope as a practice, uh, uh, what would be basically your takeaway uh, in terms of hope as a practice uh, to understand, but probably also to change possibly the social political reality of Bosnia and Herzegovina today. And I think we, we, we can all uh, uh, say uh, that the present political and social reality of Bosnia and Herzegovina is not uh, the, the, most, the most easiest one. Uh, so what would be kind of a, this kind of a contribution to understand Bosnia today uh, by reading book by, by, by dwelling into these practices of hope. Uh, I mean, not, not utopian, but alternative visions uh, of, of, of Boston today. Whoever wants to, to start. <laughs> 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 I 
No, it's like uh, it's a hard question, so I really want to. <laughs> but then I'm gonna. Uh, I mean, yeah. just few thoughts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but th this is really funny because when you mentioned the, you know writing about beekeepers mm -hmm. and 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 sort of like my my family is into beekeeping and this is like one thing that I really really like and it's really easy for me to connect. So in the same field work there, uh, like near the monument, there are two Wahhabi guys who are beekeepers and it was really funny how I had like a zero sort of like boundary. I just got there and I was like, okay, so how many, like you never ask beekeepers how many hives, but it's like, how are the societies doing? Da -da 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 -da. And we <laughs> immediately established rapport. And we immediately like, the next thing was coffee and then I dunk and everything else. <laughs> and I was really, I, I was really like looking forward, for example, when Larissa Sharevich uh, was working on her project on beekeeping. I was really uh, looking forward, but then like she actually deals with uh, the images of apocalypse in Islamic teaching. So I don't really <laughs> think that's the best example of hope. Uh, but like what what for for me professionally means is that the, 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 it, navigating this thing because like I think that we we lay so much focus on discussing the political lockdown that now currently we are not producing enough knowledge on, on, on good subjectivities, on, on good sort of understanding of themselves. And this is where I see my work. So I'm gonna let you guys speak about politics, I'm gonna let you do that, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and try to write about these beekeepers who are just you know doing their best kind of day in nature. And I think maybe if we sort of direct some of focus over there, that actually also we allow people to read about their good lives as well, and maybe transformation might, might come from there as well. And over, over these years, I've seen so many examples of, of, of good life and hope where, where you don't expect it. For example, when Vizier opened Tuzla Airport, for example, they hired first Bosnian flight attendants. And trust me, these were the most cheerful people I ever met. Like, it was like, this is so glamorous, and at the same time, it was a budget company. So you can imagine sort of like, but these people are like flying to Georgia, and they were flying to the Netherlands, and you know, they were like riding skies, and they were really, <laughs> and I really was excited for, for them. Or, or people that are traveling their buses from, to Switzerland and back, and, and they're like doing small sm scale smuggling, but they found solidarity, and they sort of find loyalty in the most weirdest places, and they sort of like, uh, like sort of support each other on border crossings, even when you know people are not doing something illegal, but just confused. And I, I thought that that was a beautiful thing to write about. So even though I, I might sound naive, and I'm aware of that, this is where, where I'm gonna go. I mean, just just you know to underline loyalty and solidarity, I, I think the, these would be like two crucial uh, crucial terms. I mean, when we look at Boston, we usually emphasize ethnopolitics, divisions political crisis, etc., etc. But where are the loyalties? Where is the, where are the, the sources of solidarity? And I just last week was in Pristina for uh, uh, a conference of 150 activists from all over the region. And there were many Bosnians. And they all basically focused on how to fight the, 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 the construction of mini hydropower plants that protect Bosnian livers. And that's all about solidarity and loyalty with the nation and to Bosnia. And I think that's, that's one of the, of the crucial moments of practices of hope. <laughs> Jennifer, what would be your take? Uh, first of all, thank you for mentioning Martha Nussbaum, who I had some interaction with when I was in the University of Chicago, and she's an ethereal presence um, and, and a wonderful scholar. Uh, and to sort of link that with practices of hope and, and, and this field is, I think, uh, I will take it as a compliment. Um, to sort of try to connect ideas of hope. I think it's very easy to focus on the negative. I think it's very easy and um, sort of, it lends itself very easily to complaining, which is a Bosnian sport, that <laughs> if there was an Olympic sport and complaining, we would have the gold medal. Um, I think that is an easy one, but I think, um, I speak now as an American, right, um, from a country that is very broken, but very large, and where it's very difficult to create change. Versus, I think, in Bosnia, in a small country with a small number of people, with so many individuals who do sort of want to contribute in multiple generations, um, where I do think that there is a potential for change that is much easier um, in, a, in a sort of faster way. You can see change because there are so many things that are broken. Right? Whereas I think in the US or in societies that are sort of larger and, and, and more, you know, uh, whatever you want to say, not othered, right? not westernized, not EU, um, I think that change looks different. Whereas I think in Bosnia, you, with a little bit of hope, you can put together you know, activists who are focused on the environment, who are focused on you know, 
feeding or making sure that these kinds of hydro projects don't happen, where you really can sort of see the impact of your actions if you just stick through it a little bit longer, if you stop complaining, if you sort of have a little bit of that hope. And I think it is something we see over and over again in Bosnia. It is incremental, it is very small. You know, you take one step forward and then maybe two steps back, but there is always forward moving. Um, and I think that in many ways, through the sort of continued negative stories of, okay, the country is not in the EU yet. Um, you know, there is this political lockdown or, 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 or frozen uh, conflict or whatever ongoing. I think those kind of larger neg narratives tend to then overlook <coughs> those things that are actually <coughs> happening and changing on the ground. And I think those are the things that, you know, Misha focuses on in his scholarship, I think, is very much the focus <coughs> of those individuals who are, you know, who have this hope. And I think we do see it. Um, I saw it in sort of putting together this book. I see it on a daily basis with these scholars, with young individuals, with diaspora <coughs> individuals who sort of contact me and speak about this. And I think that is something that is, that is a practice of hope, of sort of changing that narrative, not giving in to, you know, complaining, which is easy. I think it's super easy to be critical <coughs> and negative and complaining, but I think in Bosnia and Herzegovina or in, or in sort of studying this or creating research frameworks on the country, it's very easy to sort of, if you dig your heels in and sort of move, you know, dedicate a little bit of time, scholarship, um, that there is a potential to sort of shift and move these, uh, these blocks towards something that I think is more hopeful mm -hmm. for the future. Thank you so much. Well, Larissa, I think, uh, I mean, your struggle from 2000, 21 onwards was basically a very concrete practice of hope coming from diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you want to continue? Do you want to, I mean, you know, have to dedicate your time to studying and finishing exams. I mean, Larissa is also in one of my classes, so basically she has to, <laughs> to, to write the seminar paper, etc., etc. But I don't want to be, to, to have my class and the university standing uh, in between, the between, between the practices of hope uh, of us yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. and diaspora. So, uh, how do you see, see, see basically this, I mean, your exercises in practices of hope in the future? I think what was really important for us when we started our activism and now looking back is that we build a foundation. We have this mm -hmm. foundation of people we know, of people who are, I mean, you know, there's another people from the seminar now, and, and people come up and talk to me, oh, you're the one that organized the study trip. So people are talking about the young, this is what is very important, getting young people involved. This is the, the goal we wanted, and not just people from the diaspora, but also onwards more than the diaspora. And I think what it did most is give us a lot of confidence. So we will keep on doing it. I'm always the annoying one in every seminar and every room. <laughs> if somebody says, the EU will be 27 people, uh, still 27 countries in 10 years. I will be the one saying, no, no, you're forgetting some countries there and always be the one that will, and, uh, and even if we're annoying, we don't care anymore because it means we're doing it together. So I think this is what was very important, finding this place of belonging. And this is a lot of hope, I think. This is a lot of hope seeing things can go well. And even if it's a film movie theater, it's still, I don't know, it gave me a drive, I think, for the next 10 years to keep on going. <laughs> and also within Bosnia, just what things happening, as you mentioned, and also, for example, <coughs> what I think what was very nice for me to see as well was when one month ago, there were pride activists in Berlin who were being attacked, and um, I talked to my friends about it, and they said, well, I mean, Bosnia is still a very patriarchal society, we have to admit. But um, it was it was talked about in Western media, I would say. But friends of mine asked me about it. Said, "Oh, isn't that typical for Bosnia?" And then in the same week, more activists came on the street, had a demonstration, said they are with the people from the Pride in the national Bosnian TV. The, I think the first time people talked about queerness. So things are happening. The society is open. We just have to keep on going and be loud. Things are happening. Uh, and now the questions are hopefully happening. I would suggest uh, uh, that we collect two or three, four questions and then bring it back to the podium. So I see uh, dozens of hands. <laughs> <laughs> At least those hands that I see are very strong hands. Uh, so 
So we're gonna start. <laughs> you raise the head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Play, it, play, it, play it fast, please. Yeah. But you, you can also go. I mean, just yeah, okay. a quick, quick, precise question. I mean, that's what we need in, in short comments. But okay, I see. Sure. Sure, yes, yes. So, uh, my name is Kim Saito, PhD student at the University of Vienna, and I'm interested in the Austrian security policy. I'm writing on the thesis uh, of PhD thesis about our Austrian engagement for EU enlargement to Western Balkans, and especially Bosnia. And one question is, uh, one question is, okay, well, from Austrian point of view, the EU integration of Western Balkans or uh, uh, Bosnia is, is uh, key to good right for, I mean, so in this uh, good right is uh, right with the uh, European values like democracy, human rights, or uh, rule of rules. But I can't uh, exclude uh, the Bosnian people or Bosnian diaspora or any Bosnian people have uh, different, uh, different image to the good right inside of the European Union or uh, after the uh, European Union, so that's why I can't, uh, I can't exclude. So in European context, the Austrian were in the so I just say Austria, so uh, what you, so a uh, citizen of EU member states under Bosnia have uh, different paths, uh, different image or different definition of uh, good life in Europe. And the second question is, so, how to communicate? Uh, how uh, how should uh, the the scholars of Bosnian studies, but with a Bosnian background and with a Bosnian background, uh, communicate? Or how should the relationship between the uh, scholars with and without Bosnian background? Because I I am afraid uh, I I I I am afraid of uh, risking uh, the Bos the scholars with Bosnian uh, backgrounds. Are risking some uh, is my thing to is my vision of uh, Bosnian <coughs> studies. Okay, at first uh, we are pri uh, privileged uh, in the in the scientific community because of the knowledge from the history, background, or language, and finally so they think okay, only Bosnian can understand Bosnia. So I think so that's why this uh, in my opinion it's quite important to how to communicate or the how to relate the or uh, scholars of Bosnian studies uh, each other. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And once you finish your PhD, we're going to include you into the Bosnian studies. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm I mean with the teeth. Uh, for the I mean to keep our fingers crossed for the PhD. Elisa. So, um, yeah. Elisa, how spell? She told the joke. She what? told the joke, she she told the joke that Misha mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, the joke. Um, but by the way, uh, when I was doing this uh, research recently in Bihaj, I did not hear, I heard one joke only the entire, the entire year. I thought that was really strange. So it's not necessarily... So the society is changing. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I've been thinking, I mean, okay, so I'm really glad you addressed this. Um, I'm really excited to see the book. I'm really glad you um, talked about, you know, uh, is it only Bosnians can really understand Bosnia, or you talked about these different, different positionalities of you know being a di diaspora or Bosnians who are studying in, in Western universities? Um, it's something I've been thinking about a long time because obviously um, I don't have an each name. I've been trying to understand Bosnia for about 30 years now, and um, there's still a sense that okay, there's something I don't get, or you know other people have more of a, of a knowledge of a, of a background, right? Um, and there's always this this assumption though that that, that Bosnians will, will automatically know better, right? So my question is about Bosnians who actually live in Bosnia and the state of of Bosnian scholarship, um, but also uh, in Croatia and Serbia and Slovenia there are scholars there. I know from anthropology, especially in Croatia, there are people who have been studying doing studies on Bosnia from Croatia. And I see some of the same patterns repeated, you know, more more access to resources, more privilege, um, a sort of sometimes uh, a view of the, on the you know the, the, the more primitive or the, the, the less European. Um, it, it can go both ways, right? So I think it's it's, it's very complex obviously and there are all these different positionalities. Um, but I just wanted to, to hear maybe your your thoughts about um, 
the state of scholarship in Bosnia. Um, I co-edited a book like this a long time ago, and we could not find, uh, we, we had one Bosnian, and it was Larry Slavish from Yashar, which contributed. Um, but at the time, with, with anthropology, because it was anthropology, um, there is there still is no anthropology in Bosnia itself, which is why it was really difficult. But the people li living and working in Bosnia also didn't have the resources even to go outside to the village and, and do their own field work um, uh, the way people in Bosnia do. Okay. Thank you so much, Elisa. Uh, one or two more questions. I mean, the left side of the room I mean, is usually much louder. Uh, I have a brief question because I want to know uh, your opinion. What makes Bosnian studies different from, let's say, Bulgarian studies? There's also a Bulgarian diaspora here. I've con lived some contacts with them because I lived also in Bulgaria. And, um, or Macedonian, uh, because uh, what is the, the in your view, the difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. At this point, um, I, I'm wondering, uh, we have always been using the term Bosnia all, over, all along, and, and uh, neglecting the Bosnia and Herzegovina thing. Is that an uh, unconscious... Um, uh, it's in the first sentence in the introduction. It says, "Yeah, but in yes. simply Bosnia." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you. And, and there was no folk. We, we mentioned Dodik and uh, but never the Croatian element, which is small, but it, internationally speaking, and for the future of, of Bosnia Herzegovina, of Bosnia is is uh, will be important. So now, now I can mention Chovic. <laughs> <laughs> You've been waiting this whole time. I've been waiting the whole evening to mention his name. Uh, so one last question. Uh, no, then turn, I turn back to... Yeah. Yeah, I, I would love to actually... Uh, you just speak in I, 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 I don't want to... Uh, I mean, I'm addressing like two of your questions, more or less. Uh, I, I don't really... Would, I wouldn't like to be understood as nativist, because I'm really not arguing for that. And it's really funny. I like how you mentioned that, because I, uh, me, uh, how do you say that? I name a shti poem and isti odam there. And I also heard that as soon as I moved out the next year, people, somebody would come back and tell me that. Uh, I, what I think is that we should, we should speak about that Bosnian scholarship is written in English, first of all, today. And what is written in Bosnia does not get read enough. And what I read, sometimes I'm not really happy with that, what I'm reading. When we speak about anthropology, it's a really interesting question because they are like, two working anthropologists in Bosnia, and one of them is Steph Janssen, the other one is this new person who just got hired in the same institution, uh, who is a, a sort of Catholic priest, and etc. So it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm just going, I'm going to, uh, no, no, but, but, the, but the, what I'm heading at is that like, we don't have infrastructure in Bosnia. And even though there is this attitude that you're not from there and you don't know the reality, the, the reality is that we don't have infrastructure there and we should work and address that. <laughs> And I think what you were suggesting is that the only answer is actually sort of reading each other and building upon each other and then thinking how we can make it available and approachable for the, for the society and as, as well. Uh, if I may use a little bit more space, and, and this is something that uh, sort, of, uh, sort of I'm thinking about also, what is that that Bosnia is giving? And I think like, like right now I'm, I'm dealing with more like history of technology and these sort of tropes of, of Bosnia being bring into modern times uh, uh, through studying is like old as, as, as uh, technology is old. And, and for me it's also like really, uh, I, I find it really annoying that people don't see value in it, but that's also because I'm from there maybe, so I see too much value. But if I would say what differs Bosnia from, from Bulgaria and not that much from Macedonia is something that I would like to use neologism of Yugo-futurism, maybe. Uh, <laughs> something that is uh, speaking and thinking about social real realities, ways of producing knowledge, and ways of, of moving things forward that have some heritage in Yugoslavia that are not necessarily Yugo-nostalgia and don't really care about Yugo-nostalgia that, that much, but are based on this communication of this, of this project of socialist modernity and what happened to us later and what we are, where we are going. And the other thing is, uh, another neologism which I would like to use, which is how I call myself also, is like trans Mahalusha, which is a person, <laughs> like Mahalusha is this person in Bosnia that goes around the village and everybody knows that person, they're everywhere. And now Bosnia sort of moved out and it's becoming like transnational, and, but also translocal. 
And, and for me, like often when we speak about Bosnia, what, what annoys me is that we speak about Bosnia in these sedentary categories. Like Bosnia is there, it's a country that didn't move in time, and we are helping to democratize and come to our time. But the reality is that not only that third of Bosnia already lives in the EU, and it's very well integrated and lives good life already here, but also the people that are, already, that are there are also very much included and sort of making their own way of how to organize their time and their, their modernity in their life. So this is sort of like Transmahalusha and Yugo Futurism are what helps me to think about it in a, in a sort of uh, special way, but yeah, it's a conversation to be had. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have too, too much to add to that. I think there is this sort of, with any sort of area of studies, um, a, a potential for comparative um, work to be done. And I think Misha spoke very clearly on this question of what lens are we looking at it from. It's not just Bosnia and Herzegovina as the lens. I mean, that is sort of the umbrella, but it is very much the, the mahala, right? The, from a very different perspective of the neighborhood, this sort of larger region, uh, you know, an entity, etc., and really sort of playing with this, uh, with this idea of the translocal. Um, in, in, in a multitude of the chapters, we really sort of focus on, on this question. Um, so there is there is that to be said. I think when we speak about EU enlargement, I'm not an Austrian uh, po foreign policy scholar. Um, I, I, I edited another book on, on the foreign policy of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, where we sort of argue that there is a foreign policy of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's not great. It is not how to do foreign policy. We don't do it well, but it does exist and it is moving um, forward. There are institutions and actors uh, that exist that are trying to move it forward. It is a very slow step, I think. I don't, and, and it's no surprise to anybody in this room that the EU enlargement process is uh, very, very slow, if not stopped in the country currently. Um, but I think there's other individuals in this room that can speak to that, I think, much, much more, um, in, a, in a much more sort of lucid way than, than I. Um, can and yeah, I think. I don't know so much. I just one thing uh, that you um, just because I would say I'm mean, not a finished scholar or anything yet, but I think you were if you were if you would not be allowed to study Bosnia just because you don't have Bosnian heritage, and it would be the same as if I said I need to study something about Bosnia because I have a Bosnian heritage. So I think it's uh, actually quite interesting to look at it from different lenses. Of course. Um, and to your question, why I say both, I think because I'm lazy. I know this boss here to go, you know, it's too long. easier mm -hmm. to say. Um, and I think just one final question on the sort of what does scholarship in Bosnia look like versus I think Misha spoke <coughs> on this question of translation, lack of communication, lack of being read. Um, you know, citation practices. I think in putting together this book and in sort of thinking about this as a field, we are very conscious about ensuring reading scholars working in Bosnia, publishing in Bosnia, because we all have the ability to do so. And I think it's something um, that I strive to do in my scholarship that we sort of try to do throughout the book, and I think it's something that, that needs to be discussed more and sort of as, as research practice. But I think sort of moving forward and how do we sort of uh, collaborate with scholars working in Bosnia who have, you know, less resources or who have different kinds of resources than we might, whether it's proximity, etc. Um, I think is 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 an interesting um, topic, and it's one that I've been sort of uh, working on and working towards in creating projects together, in working on scholarship together, in sort of thinking about how do we move this field together forward because. I think it's very clearly established that there are individuals outside of the country, you know, whether they're foreign born, whether they're Bosnian born, uh, whether they're second, third generation, uh, you know, it doesn't, it's not a nativist sort of uh, perspective that are very much interested in sort of thinking about these hopeful perspectives. Um, and sort of finding the spaces and the ways uh, and combining those positionalities in, think, in thinking about moving that research further, I think is sort of the, the, the current challenge. So thank you for posing the question in the room. I think this book um, that that Dan that also was discussing is, is a wonderful example of, of that as well. Um, anyways, I'll stop. <laughs> Sorry, it was and single up to uh, <laughs> Don't forget the second one. If I can just add one more thing. Course, yes. I think especially from someone from the diaspora, I think it means so much if you see, like once I started studying political science, for example, you don't really see names that sound like mine or like ours. And I think then seeing 
names and seeing scholars from your home countries producing something, but not only about your home country, but also um, about different topics. Um, this, this kind of, it's, it's a bit of a leap of hope of we are everywhere, and there is a space for us, and there is a space um, for if you want to talk about Bosnia, you can, and, but you don't have to. And I think that this is just to say thank you again for making this book. Thank you so much. If there is a last very urgent question, then I take one or two more. From the uh, left side <laughs> of the room. Finally, Robert Klaus was the first one to go. break this vicious circle from the left. So, uh, yes. yes. So, thank you, dear all, for your uh, presentation. Uh, so, one of you mentioned uh, the importance of the influence of the foreigners in, the, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yes. Uh, having been one of these foreigners, between 1992 and 2003 for UN and NATO. I would, be, uh, I would like to know a bit more about your, uh, your impression, about, not of, about uh, the, the institution level, but between the, the, the people, meaning. Because for me, as there during the war time and later on, I, well, I had a lot of interconnection with the, the, the people, the, the national, the local there. And of course, I guess that I have the, some unknown and unexpected influence on these people. Well, perhaps, I don't know. But this is why I would like to, to know a bit more. For what, what, what is your, um, mm -hmm. what was you, your perception of this uh, personal, individual interconnection between foreigners and uh, nationals there in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Uh, if any. I guess it has an influence on the about yes, identity, sure. yeah. on the diaspora, on the creation of diaspora, and so I guess. Yes, of course. So. Well, I, I have a question. When I was listening to you, a question to you as a panel. Um, is there, are there any studies uh, how the mindset of people in Bosnia and Herzegovina were when they were part of Yugoslavia? And if you compare this with now, as of course it's a different political situation, everything, but mindset is mindset. And uh, if you would compare Austria, Tyrolians and Styrians and so on, being part of Austria and uh, being part of the European Union, you would also find quite interesting uh, uh, learning points maybe. But I was just curious, uh, are there any studies in this respect that are comparing that? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I really don't have a question. Alida Vratic, also Bosnian-born, uh, living in Vienna at the moment, and I spent the last 15 years living in different countries. Um, it seems to me, uh, first of all, congratulations on this amazing book. I mean, this is something that reminds me of the stuff that I've been working on when I actually returned to Bosnia in 2007, 8, and it came out of frustration. We wanted to create a think tank that would produce actually original Bosnian work because we were so tired of reading about reconciliation, state building, uh, any other topic that you could think of, it was written by some foreigners or international organizations. So that was part of one part of frustration. The other part of frustration was resources mm -hmm. and, and lack of good stories because we live from crisis to crisis. You cannot really point at one crisis but because it, there is another one coming up. And we thought that there are so many amazing stories, but there are no resources for that. So basically what we have done is that we spent 90% of our time running in a little car, four different people, at, at times even more, and going from village to village trying to understand how this reconciliation really happened in Alkmici, how this uh, state building is ongoing in Bihar, what's happening in, in central Bosnia, what's happening elsewhere. Also getting a little bit out to the peripheries and not being only in, in, in capital cities. And um, and I think what where where we have what we have managed to do is is to really we produce lots of different good stories. I mean, I remember from the top of my head the story about potato, which was a fantastic story about Franciscans in Fornica, basically uh, bringing all people together regardless of their religion background and having them uh, do the crops because this this was something that was seasonal. It was very important for everyone. And then they started naming the crops once they actually. Uh, realized they started naming them Mejo, Sulio, Ante, I don't know, something else, different sorts of, 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 of potatoes. And we have produced these stories, but I think where we have failed, looking back now from this uh, distance, is that we didn't have that many allies in the process, because good stories are hard to sell in Bosnia. And this is something where I see our challenge collectively actually coming in, because we need to, 
start actually producing it in a way that they are, you know, duplicating themselves and really overtake a little bit of, of the political thing. One thing, and I will finish, uh, where I maybe disagree a little bit because I also done a little bit of research on diaspora and migration, is this ethical kind of approach. You know, what do we from diaspora tell them where they're, they're sitting there? Our privilege is, is, is really more than resources than anything else. It's the perspective that we get when we, when we get out. If you sit and live in Bosnia for a long time, for years, then you're being fed information that really make you depressed. And it's really hard to actually get yourself you know, active in the process, and very few manage. When you get out, you, are re you realize exactly what Janeta has been describing. Oh my god, it's a teeny tiny country. We're talking about 3 point something million people. It's actually a doable thing. We can fix so many things and without you know, major infrastructural kind of you know, massive projects. So things can happen, but you only see it when you actually go out. And this perspective allows us to, to uh, uh, drive certain processes. I mean, it happened elsewhere. It happened in Ireland, where you have diaspora driving big major projects uh, related to academia, related to scholarly work. So maybe we should just consider you know, that, yes, there is this, like, uh, don't you tell me what to do. You're sitting there, and I'm sitting there. But, but there is this, I think there is a necessity, to, if, if you will, to actually do these kind of things. And thank you, and congratulations, amazing work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amida. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief. And, and, and it's, it's a great question. And I think, like, to bring to, to answer, I, I need to bring in conversation two colleagues of mine, Andrew Gilbert and Daniela Lai. Andrew is working at Humboldt University. Daniela is in London. They're both Tansi as well, both are foreigners, right? And they both uh, they wrote uh, two, two uh, excellent books about international intervention in Bosnia. So where, where I was coming at is actually, I, since, since I moved out in Bosnia in 2008, and I was a young person and teenager during your time there, <laughs> then I was also thinking about, you know, how, what was my image? And so I was comparing my, my image with the scholarship on Strans, which is most anthropologists who wrote about these figures. And if we think about, yeah, demographics of, of foreign intervention in Sarajevo, we're speaking, what, about 10, 15,000? Or very well, <coughs> very well paid people that are cosmopolitan speaking languages, living sort of better life in late 1990s when the war finished in the early 2000s. And there were, of course, influence of, of let's say, cosmopolitan mm -hmm. sort of like flair. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also there were, uh, the, the, this is intervention as any other, where we have clientelistic relationships, we are having a lot of asymmetric power relations, we are having a lot of troubles in how the intervention was adopted. And what was interesting for me, for example, is the power of, of Stranzi when they actually arrived to the field work. Because on one side, it could be a person that's working for an NGO and it's giving money for to rebuild a house. It could be a researcher that's researching, researching a genocide and wants to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Or it can be a tourist that's grabbed a camera and is just wandering around doing gonzo journalism and doesn't really know what's going to do with that project. And where my actual position is that for all these three persons, we need some sort of standards. We need to know how they're going to engage with these people, and we need to make sure that people in the field understand that they don't have to engage. And what I think that we are still, the disconnect that we are still having is that people in the field still live in the 1990s mindset where Stranzi are bringing money or infrastructure, and they either engage in a clientelistic relationship or try to wiggle out and try to ignore. And this is sort of like where I was trying to make argument that we should really build better standards and frameworks around that experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marisa, do you want to address any of the questions? No. Or hand over to, <laughs> to Janita. Um, I have so many thoughts, but I'm also <laughs> uh, aware of the time. Yeah. I think this, this question of foreigners or Stranzi or um, others, I think there is something to be said about, you know, we speak about Bosnia and Herzegovina as a country that's always being othered, right? That's not in Europe, that's not quite West, that's not, we're not quite white, you know, these sorts of questions. But I think there's also something to be said to sort of think about the perspectives that Alida was talking about, those foreigners, the foreign diplomats, the NGOs, etc., as being a blank slate. And they're very sort of, we're very keen, and or there's a lot of sort of a keenness of, placing all the hope, you know, the Americans will help us now that Joe Biden is president, right? Um, but then on the other side, when things go wrong or things don't move as fast, well, you know, it's the foreign intervention. It's, so it's almost like there's a blank slate and there's a lot of sort of um, 
keenness to place either blame or hope or whatever you want to paint onto that blank slate onto those individuals or organizations or diplomats, which is not to say that none of it is deserved. Some of it is very well deserved in terms of both positive and negative commentary. Um, and, but that's, I think, a more normative discussion. But I think it goes back to some of the things that, that Alida was sort of reflecting on and I think also speaks to this question of mindset that, that um, the gentleman next to her, whose name I don't know, um, posed in terms of sort of thinking about, okay, but what is it that we can do within the country? Or what is it that we as scholars or we as activists outside of the country can do to move it forward? Um, to sort of think about that agency, that question of, okay, there is an idea in the room about what does this good life look like? What can it look like? Whether it's the EU, whether it's something else. Um, and how do we move it forward rather than sort of reflecting on what has not worked in the past or what has not worked enough in the past or what has gone wrong, etc. And I think that is something that where you do have this potential of opening up those conversations when you bring in diaspora voices, when you bring in individuals that are living or that have lived elsewhere in the, uh, than, than Bosnia and Herzegovina that aren't current constantly sort of within a vacuum of the same story being told over and over again, the same politicians speaking the same narratives over and over again, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, yes, yes of course. Since, of course uh, we talked about othering. I think this is one of the fear that especially um, people like I have that never, never lived in Bosnia, was not born in Bosnia, I spent my summers there, is this fear of imposing our views. And as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Alida, it's good mm -hmm. to get out and look at outside of it. But I think another element comes in when you never lived within the country. And I think this is why we need to have this open discussion within the diaspora, how we can best, um, how we can best um, react to this and how we can then deal with it in an ethical way. Um, I think this is also a very interesting perspective because the Baltic diaspora is growing. You have more and more people being born outside of Bosnia but still kind of having this Bosnian identity. And how do you then deal with it? And how then can you use it in a good way for the country and for the people living there? Misha, you wanted to? That's a I, it's all, uh, it's all part of this conversation. I have an announcement for uh, for an event uh, <laughs> that we are organizing in two weeks. <laughs> there will be a special panel afterwards. <laughs> all, all kinds of like, exactly. Just, an, no, just an, uh, if, if you want to join in another type of conversation, mm -hmm. in two weeks uh, we are hosting Damir Imamovic, who is a famous singer but also a good scholar, excellent scholar, and he's coming to you. Exactly. C CD. Uh, Here or elsewhere? So, uh, Damir Imam, which is coming in two weeks, uh, same time, but different location. Alte uh, our institute is organizing, so I can share your contact with him. Yeah, and he's going to speak about Sertak and melancholy and um, uh, other types of relationships in Sertak. So, come. And so this means we have to see each other in two weeks again. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just just to conclude, uh, I mean, thanks thanks for the questions, thanks for the attention, thank thank you for the presentations. Uh, I, I really sincerely do hope that you didn't get uh, an impression that it was a, a kind of a usual discussion about Bosnia. I mean, usually we have these discussions navigating, oscillating between, let's say, painting everything black, that uh, or romanticizing Bosnia even on the other side. Like, I mean, it's the, the country of joy and wonderful people telling jokes and, you know, delicious, uh, drinking. delicious <laughs> food, etc. Et et but I think what, what the book was about, what the discussion was about, is simply. Uh, uh, contribution to a, to a, to a, a normalization of, 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 of a narrative about Bosnia that is uh, having multifaceted perspectives, uh, insights, etc., etc. And I really think it is uh, uh, a start, uh, a beginning of something new, of emerging new fields. And I wish you uh, and us uh, and many of you uh, uh, all the best. I want to conclude by, by uh, with just one quote by Jawad Karahasan. I mean, Jawad Karahasan meant a lot uh, to many of us from Bosnia. I mean, we read his novels, we talked to him, and he was simply a, a decent person, a nice person, and a wonderful thinker. Uh, and in one of his many poems and uh, novels and, and, and books, he, he, he was telling a story basically how you can't escape Bosnia. So, I mean, he said, uh, you know, Bosnia has always been a place where people leave the country. So they've been expelled or forced to leave, or they, they just go for good, uh, uh, travel to Germany, to Austria, to work, etc., etc. Uh, and even though if they don't know what they are when they live in Bosnia, 
confused with all these identity structures, etc., etc. Once they arrive, some, somewhere in Brigitteno, or uh, a leader for you, I mean, in the eighth district, Josefstadt, which is a bit different to Brigitteno, uh, they start realizing basically. Uh, oops, <laughs> No, 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 no further comments about Austria and the city, the district. districts in Vienna. Uh, no, but the point is, so once once these Bosnians mm -hmm. arrive somewhere else, uh, uh, they start recognizing basically uh, that they miss something that they are really Bosnians. Uh, they are, I mean, uh, they, other people are just uh, address them as Bosnians, and they start being aware of this kind of a Bosnianness, yeah, if if you if you wish so. Uh, so basically, the, you can't escape Bosnia, uh, so that's Gerald Karahassan's uh, uh, message, and I hope you felt it tonight, that you can't uh, <laughs> escape uh, 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 Bosnia, uh, but the final point is basically uh, reading the book, reading also Wolfgang Petrit's book uh, and many other contributions to Bosnian studies, I think we make a next step in understanding this country simply once again beyond the constant political crisis and reproduction of this narrative that Bosnia is a doomed country and I don't think that it is. So thank you so much for tonight. If you have any questions and you want to uh, uh, have uh, insights from, from colleagues on the panel, uh, please stay a bit with us. We unfortunately don't have drinks uh, tonight, but there will be some drinks at uh, Dami Malovic's uh, <laughs> presentation two weeks. Um, uh, thank you, thank you once once again for joining. Uh, <laughs>